business interests. Mike McCarthy examines the repercussions of one venture which has led to misery for thousands of people and made Mr. Brealey a wanted man 5,000 miles away. The Dreshwa on the outskirts of Calcutta, dotted around the vast Ganges Delta, are the jute mills that provide employment for tens of thousands of workers. Once they were the powerhouses of India's economy, but industrial unrest and antiquated machinery have in recent times brought the jute industry to its knees. The problem is high labor oriented orientation with high labor costs with traditional old equipment still running, which is uh, not a very healthy phenomenon. And with the past losses, people were not able to renovate and put uh, money in the industry. Within the jute industry, a company called Titago was considered to be slowly dying. Silent mills, unpaid workers, and considerable anger. The trade union activists of communist-run West Bengal left no one in any doubt that what they regarded as the exploitation of workers would have to stop. Enter Reginald John Brearley. His purchase of Titiger and its four mills may have raised eyebrows in Britain, but in India he was heralded as a man with vision. Ronald Kumar was appointed by Brearley as president of the company's four mills. His initial impression of the new chairman was that here was a man who would certainly shake up the ailing company. We put a lot of target before me. Mr. Ronald, I want this. A whole building should be painted. I want to complete change the environment of this company. I want all the machines should be painted. But I, as a professional, I thought he is really interested in the company and in the group. And on behalf of him, we had to talk to workmen, we had to talk to unions, we had to talk to different people. Projecting his image very high. Mr. Bailey is a sincere man. It was not in India alone that Reg Brearley's new venture was welcomed. To say that the London Stock Exchange responded favourably to his arrival is an understatement. When news of Mr. Brearley's controlling stake in Titaga reached the market, investors clamoured for shares, sending the price up from £1.30 to £2.15 in one day. From there, the share shot up, ending the year at £5.10, 1988's best performing share. They were eventually to peak at more than 18 pounds. Excited investors saw Titago rise from obscurity. Reg Brearley looked set to be a business star of India and a darling of the stock market. I think it was a case in those days when a successful entrepreneur's name was linked uh, to a company. It inevitably attracted uh, some investment attention. It is remembered as an unusual case. Uh, I mean, there have been examples before of, of that kind of movement, but it is most unusual to get that pace of movement in such a short period of time. What looked like an incurably sick company now looked capable of an incredible recovery. Shareholders could scarcely wait to join this advancing firm. Reg Brearley, who we knew of, uh, coming from Lincolnshire, uh, had recently got involved in it, he'd bought a majority stake and it was his intention to do much with the company. I asked him then before I had a drink or lunch with him, who did he represent? Did he represent the chairman or did he represent the shareholders? And he said, I represent the shareholders. The expectation was that Mr. Brearley would uh, refinance uh, the company make acquisitions in Britain using the asset base in Calcutta with which to borrow money and diversify uh, the company's interests, giving it a better uh, exposure in Britain and at the same time, very importantly of course, revitalizing the jute industry in Calcutta with which to get the cash flow.
Mr Brearley pledged in official documents to put Teetega on a sound commercial footing and through investment to make it a success. Although a newcomer to India, Reg Brearley was already well known in Britain. His chairmanship of Sheffield United Football Club made the entrepreneur a high profile figure. He was soon to become well known in West Bengal too, but for the wrong reasons. It gradually became clear that there was not to be an upturn in Titaga's fortunes. The company continued to make heavy losses. Now they're desperate to work in the Titaga factories, but six years after Reg Brearley became chairman, the mills still suffer long periods of closure. We went to the mills in an effort to discover for ourselves the true situation at Titaga, but each time we tried to gain access, our efforts were thwarted. This is Shamnagar Mill, one of four owned by Mr Brearley and for most of this year, the only one in full production. The workers here are earning enough to give their families a reasonable living at least, but for other Titaga employees, it's a different story. Thousands of workers left idle by the frequent closures of Titaga mills are forced to find a living in whatever way they can. But why is it that these mill workers and many others like them feel so aggrieved? And why is it that Titaga PLC is worse off now than it was six years ago when Mr. Brearley took over? Sporadic stoppages have long been a problem in West Bengal's jute mills. Titaga have had their fair share of industrial unrest. But workers claim that under Mr. Brearley's chairmanship, basic employment rights have been further undermined. One example they say relates to their pension scheme, known as the Provident Fund. Documents we've obtained show that Mr. Brearley faces criminal charges in India because Titaga has allegedly deducted money from workers' pay packets but not pass that money on to the fund, the only form of income for retired employees. Many say they've been unable to retire because of the non-payment. Extremely important for a country like India because larger number of the working population do not have a very high wage. And there is no superannuation pension. Therefore, he will have to fall back upon his provident fund savings after retirement. In his role as chairman of the Provident Fund Commission, Gurudas Das Gupta, MP, is instrumental in helping to form laws to protect workers from defaulting employers. Do you believe that the workers can uh, function or workers can do their job with, with the, uh, when they're hungry? They've been forced to go without wages, they have been forced to live under stagnation and uh, uh, serious uh, poverty and they have to face periodic close down. In such a situation they were extremely desperate. They really believed Mr. Bialy. Titagar is not the only jute company to default on pension payments but it's worse than most. And while some companies have often defaulted, the Indian authorities are now clamping down. Warrants have been issued for Mr. Brearley's arrest. We asked a magistrate dealing with the case what would happen to him if he was found guilty. He will have to suffer punishment as provided in the law. 
it varies from uh, at present there is compulsory jail not less than six months and it extends to two years also. While the Provident Fund claims that Titaga workers have been denied more than six million pounds since Mr. Brilly took over, another organization is interested in bringing Titaga to book. Industrial workers in India who can't afford private medicine are treated in special hospitals. Without places like this, thousands of poorer employees would go untreated. At this hospital in Calcutta, a jute mill worker is being treated for the effects of starvation. Employers in India have a legal duty to help fund hospitals like this. Some companies have not been paying their fair share. Titaga is one of them. According to the authority that runs the scheme, deductions have been made from workers' pay packets but have not been passed on by the company. This is a social security scheme. So nobody should get into default. Uh, it's a social crime. You have an opportunity to explain your cases. You have an opportunity to appeal to higher authority. Even you have an opportunity to go to the court. But please do pay up the dues and don't deprive the workers of their due. It's for allegedly defaulting on workers' dues that former Titaga director Narendra Srivastava was arrested and imprisoned. Although the guards prevented us from filming the interview, he told us he should not have to bear sole responsibility. I am the director of the company, and Mr. Bailey is the chairman, our boss. He is, uh, he is our head of the uh, chairman, you know. So, ultimate responsibility lies on the chairman also. Srivastava is not the only director to suffer under Reg Bailey's regime. Ronald Kumar remembers clearly the indignity of his dismissal. At 8 p.m. in the night, the Sanitary Srivastava, along with some retired personnel, came to the factory. They took me to guest house and they said, here's your termination letter. They gave me the letter. I denied it. I told him, I'm a director of a company. When the board meeting was held, I was not called in that meeting. They are not giving any notice. So this letter is illegal. The man who Reginald Brealy once congratulated for his exemplary efforts was out. From the boardroom to the work floor, Titaga has left many of its own employees in difficulties. These are the living quarters of the Victoria Jute Mill. Thousands of people here depend on the mill to make a living. And without it, many find it a struggle to survive. Bonus <laughs> The dissatisfaction stretches to the local council too. According to the municipal leader, one way or another, Titaga's actions affect everyone locally. Uh, we have got two jute mills and they have not been paying taxes uh, for almost last five years. Uh, near about 10,000 people who work in these factories are either out of employment right at this moment or some are being deprived of their due wages in the factory. For this reason, they cannot pay even the, their municipal taxes to be paid to this municipality timely. Uh, so we have to face financial crisis and we have approached the state government to uh, realize this position. Documents obtained by Close Up North show clearly that Chairman Reginald Brealy was aware that Titaga owed money to the Provident Fund, the ESI, the local council and to its own workers. A personal pledge to agree settlement of the Provident Fund dues by March of this year has not been fulfilled. It's claimed that the Angus Mill, silent for much of the year, could have been revived had Mr Brealy kept a promise to invest. That promise was made to Ramroop Gupta, 
whose job is to decide whether the government should intervene in an effort to prevent a winding up order on a sick mill. He appeared in one of the hearings and he said that he was very eager to rehabilitate the company. And some of the workers in that hearing, if I recollect correctly, also said that he would be able to do so. What did he say exactly? Did he talk about investing money or not? Yes, he did. How much? He did not indicate the money, but he said whatever money is required, I would be in a position to procure that and rehabilitate the company. And you believed him? Naturally, when he appeared and he showed his sincerity, we gave him not one, not once, but two or three opportunities to do so. Ultimately, in April 90, we gave some date and said that enough is enough. We have given you more opportunities. If you fail to do so, we cannot keep this case on hold for long. And therefore, in May 1990, we had ultimately to send our opinion to the Calcutta High Court for winding up. Angus Mill is currently under the supervision of a receiver. Amid the turmoil of Reginald Brealey's business life in India, Titika diversified last year in a most unexpected way. It was to take many shareholders by surprise. From the seething heat of bustling Calcutta, the company's empire stretched to a very different place, 5,000 miles away. Noidart is described as one of Scotland's last true wilderness areas. When Titega discovered it was on the market, they decided to buy. The peace and beauty of this remote peninsula belies a bitter controversy that has caused considerable anger in the local community. It began with a planning application to set up a scheme on Noidart called Back to Basics, which involved the training of disadvantaged youngsters. Local farmer Ian Wilson clearly remembers a meeting in which Noidart residents learned what the scheme was all about. It really turned out to be more like a military briefing than a, than a sort of harmonious public meeting. Um, in which we were told, you know, they were going to reintroduce this back to basics training scheme. They were going to reintroduce the boys into the community. Um, it was going to be up and running in two months' time. If, you know, if we didn't like it, that was it. That's what they were going to do. I mean, you can see around here what, you know, what we have. And, and, and uh, it's a totally different way of life to, to city life. Um, we just felt that it, it, it was the wrong place, it was the wrong scheme. It was, it's not what Noidert needed. You know, Noidert needs something on a, on a safer scale to, to preserve what, what is here. And they're seeing us, they're running up into the gully. You see the, the black cliff there? Yep. I'm against the whole scheme because I mean, now that it's a special place, it's a secure place. He wasn't prepared to tell us which, what type of people he was trying to bring through here or the type of scheme that he, was, he wouldn't guarantee anything. And his attitude from the start, he was just going to say this is what's going to happen, you can like it or lump it. Well, otherwise, it's brought the community together because it, it was perceived by the majority of people here that Back to Basics was a threat. Um, <clears throat> this came out in a poll that we conducted, a secret poll, uh, where I think 68 ballot forms were issued, um, 54 re were returned and 50 were opposed to the scheme. So it really brought us to all together on that, on that particular issue. Before the local council had chance to pass judgment on the planning application, the company published a brochure saying that the project was underway. It spoke of young people being taken to India to train in the Titaga jute mills. The planning application was rejected. But that wasn't the end of Titaga's problems on Noidart. Surrey businessman Philip Rhodes is the man who sold Noidart to Titaga for £1.7 million. He was forced to take court action to recover money owed to him by the company. Probably the most serious thing for me was that the, um, the deal was to be concluded in January 93. Uh, it eventually was uh, the missives were exchanged, the contracts were exchanged in um, March 93 with, uh, with 
completion in March, uh, no money <laughs> came through. Usual story, March, it was going to happen at the end of March, then at the end of April, then at the beginning of May, and eventually um, most of the money was paid out at the, uh, in June. So that put me to an enormous amount of um, problems. When you've promised to pay somebody and you have a completion that is due, everyone imagines you've received the money, which I hadn't. So that, the, the, there were enormous losses I incurred there, and it nearly bankrupted me. Eighteen months after the deal had originally been struck and just as we were about to interview Mr Rhodes, a message came through from the new owners that the final debt had been paid. Skeptical, he went to find out for himself. Uh, I wonder if I can phone from the pub. Maybe some money has changed hands, but I think it's a bit... I mean, you know as well as I do, this was supposed to happen about three weeks ago and it didn't happen yesterday and it was promised. Now, why has it suddenly happened today? And has it actually happened? Is it cleared funds? What, what has actually happened? After Mr Rhodes left, we discovered that Tietiger had finally settled the bill by paying an outstanding £120,000. However, the former owner claims he still owed money for damages and loss of interest. Mike Reynolds was the man brought in to run Back to Basics. He backs Brearley's ambitions, but not necessarily the way he's gone about achieving them. Philip Rhodes has now been paid what is required uh, from the point of view of his inland revenue debts. Those debts should have been paid a long time ago. And not only that, um, Philip Rhodes has had to go to a lot of trouble to take us to court, etc. And therefore, certain costs are due to him. The matter now is uh, between the lawyers as to how much those costs should be. I wish to goodness that these two intelligent men would get together and actually say this is agreeable and that is not. With slow progress on Back to Basics, the future ownership of Noidart seems uncertain. As for Tietiger's plans for this corner of the Scottish Highlands, many locals wait with a sense of unease. Their distrust of Tietiger, and particularly of the man at the helm, is reflected among some of the people who once regarded themselves on Reg Brealey's side. They include his own brother. Len Brealey feels that he's had a raw deal in his involvement with Reg and remembers with anger a particular conversation. What he said to me was that this Tietiger company of his was going to take off. He said they were making profits. Um, they were going to be floated on the American market and he said that if I took half a million shares in the company then in March of this year I would be able to sell them for a million and a half dollars and um, I would be able to repay all my debts and uh, we'd be back to square one again. Other shareholders feel they too have reason to question their chairman. He thanked me for being patient all these years and said the problems were shortly coming to an end. There would be an announcement made uh, after Christmas. And if I waited until then, not only would we get our money back in full, but we could make more besides. Naturally, if a chairman of a company makes that sort of statement, uh, one feels comforted. What? So I waited until we got the announcement. In fact, the announcement was only a hyped copy of the 1993 results. Well, I sincerely uh, hope, as I've asked him uh, many times now, to back down to get rid of his, uh, his shares at the best price he can and to move over to let the company be run by people who actually can run it for the benefit both of the company, for the industry, for India, for England, and for the shareholders. Uh, Tidiger is in a in a position where if it cannot very quickly uh, make deals with the trade unions based on cash being put into their pension fund, and if it cannot make deals with the jute broker brokers based on cash being paid for a large amount of jutes, it will go to the dogs very quickly. There's 16, 17,000 workers there, all of whom have dependents, and I'm sure the local government do not wish to see it go to the dogs. What has angered some shareholders is what they see as a list of promises made by the chairman which have not been kept. 
In his last statement, the chairman spoke of listing the company's shares in the United States, raising $50 million there for investment in Tisaga, developing its Western market with biotechnical products, and settling plans to pay off outstanding provident fund dues by March this year. None of these aims have so far been achieved. So frustrated are shareholders by Tietiger's record under Reg Brearley that in a move led by his brother Len, they've secured an extraordinary general meeting. The resolutions include a vote of confidence in which shareholders will be given a chance to pass judgment on the chairman's performance. I am going to say you're going to have to stand up on the platform and you're going to have to answer all the resolutions that I have put forward in this uh, document calling an extraordinary general meeting. Would it not be simpler all round and would it not cause you a lot less trouble simply to drop it? Well, definitely. Um, I'm, my wife would love me to drop it and walk away from it. She hates us. Uh, all this uh, nonsense and publicity, but you can't do it. He's recorded television interviews before, but on this occasion, Reg Brearley turned down our request. In letters from his solicitor, however, he says there's been no misappropriation of statutory dues. His lawyers say that the jute industry has been notorious for 20 years in defaulting on statutory payments in order to keep workers employed during lean periods. Mr. Brearley says the day-to-day -day management of mills is the responsibility of the people who supply the jute. But that's not good enough for the authorities in India. They say Mr. Brearley should take responsibility for the actions of his company. A growing band of shareholders, too, refuse to accept Mr. Brearley's assurances for the future of Titaga. And those who've already lost out, the workers without pay and the workers without pensions, feel that the man who promised so much has, in the end, delivered so little. has issued another statement. It said the company for many years kept on staff at times when the cost of jute production was more than the sale price. It added, in doing this, the company supported its workers. Provident fund monies were used, the workers always knew. The company had disclosed the liability and intended to meet it. The statement said any default of statutory payments in India resulted in arrest warrants, but that did not prevent Mr. Brealey from travelling within West Bengal. Previous form suggested in Reg Brearley arrived at Bramall Lane for this morning's meeting to a protest by fans angry at his financial management of the First Division side as its chief shareholder. At the moment we have a chairman who says that he's got the club on the market. Um, he won't name the price, although we're, we understand that it's in the region of three and a half million pounds, um, which to us is the same as putting a house, uh, a 50,000 pound house on the market and asking £100,000 for it. So it does seem on the face of it as though he has no intention of, of selling the club. According to the agenda, the Blades' five-man board looks set to receive directors' reports, approve accounts and reappoint auditors. But fans and shareholders have other questions they want answered. Before the meeting started, the message to Mr Brearley was clear. A pub landlord who's admitted selling watered-down spirits to his customers. Members for the club's annual shareholders' meeting Crowds of fans gathered outside Bramall Lane to blame Reg Brealey for the club's slip from Premier League status down to the First Division and to call for his resignation. Mr Brealey told them he was willing to sell off his majority shareholding and he denied holding the club in a financial stranglehold. Denise Gravel reports. Reg Brealey arrived at Bramall Lane this morning where angry fans were waiting to raise questions about the financial running of the First Division side. Following the meeting, which for the first time was held in private, 
The chairman said his majority stake in the club, said to be worth three and a half million pounds, is still up for grabs. The club is now in a financial position where someone can come in and support the club with guarantees. They don't have to come in and put money in the club. It's strong enough on its own feet. And if a man of substance is there outside, he wants to come in and guarantee uh, several million pounds, then he should make contact with me and come along. In recent weeks, fans have been using match day to openly register their disapproval of the club chairman. Today, frustrated shareholders got no joy from Reg Brearley when they tried to publicly grill him on financial matters. Very disappointing, really. It's much as we thought it would be. Um, firstly, that the chairman has no intentions of investing any money in players at all. So he's relying on Dave Bassett to keep the team afloat on a shoestring budget. Don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but, you know, we just wish he'd hurry up and go. Other members of the Blades board are backing Mr. Brealey. Some blame relegation from the Premier League for the current problems. By the mere fact of not having uh, very good gates and not getting off to a very good start, which I understand. Once we've only getting 13,000 people in, it does have a problem with us because we're losing money. In a bid to end the meeting on a high note, Reg Brealey hit back at skeptics and revealed the building on the multi-million pound John Street stand is set to resume. We've got most of the finance, I think, in place. It's just the balance of the short mezzanine sub-finance that we're waiting for. But I, I do believe we'll press the button in January and we'll still be on course for completion for next season. Despite a recent run of success for Sheffield United, the feeling at Bramall Lane today was that it didn't signify a turning point for the struggling club. OK, well, now it's time to take in the rest of the day. From there, it was down here. Sheffield United Reg Brearley has appealed to the club's fans to back the board and stop working against the club. Supporters from the Blades Independent Fans Association lobbied this morning's annual general meeting to demand the chairman's resignation. They blame him for the club's relegation from the Premier League. But tonight, Mr Brearley has appealed for harmony. Dozens of members of the Blades Independent Fans Association lobbied Sheffield United's annual general meeting to urge the chairman, Reg Brealey, to sell his majority stake in the club. They're angry that Brealey hasn't made large amounts of money available for new players. Is he still in the club? What happened to the money he received or reported to have received from Paul Woolhouse when he defaulted on the shares? What is his valuation at the club? How does he value, how, how does he arrive at that? Why has Dave Bassett been robbed of the money that he was promised in his transfer kit? All these sort of questions that all we feel all united eyes are waiting to find the answers to. For the first time, representatives of the media were excluded from the AGM. After the meeting, some shareholders were angry at what they'd heard from the chairman. It was uh, evasive and inconclusive, and uh, there was nothing really there that, that, was of, uh, that was good news for the supporters, really. It's much of the same. From a supporter's point of view, I would say to him, in God's name, go, because of the, the situation is nobody's going to invest in this club until he is gone. Mr Brealey has said he is still prepared to sell the club at an asking price of £3.5 million, but he says the right offer hasn't come along yet. Uh, a lot of names are mentioned, uh, people, there's a lot of publicity derived from uh, expressing an interest, but when it comes to real hard uh, money in negotiations, it doesn't apply. Shareholders were also told today that construction work on the new John Street stand should start next month. Next season, United could be back in the Premiership. Their victory at Swindon this week means they're well-placed for a promotion challenge in the new year. But 1995 is also sure to mean more arguments about the future ownership of the club. The mother of a...